the third show, actually, is the one moment where we do look into the future, because uh -huh. Channel 4 has asked us to do that. Sure. And uh, so what's your vision of, you know, 10 years from now with this technology that you're, that you're developing? Well, you know, I think the internet and the web, there are two exciting things happening in software and, and in computing today. I think one is objects, but the other one is the web. The web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams that the computer would ultimately not be primarily a device for computation, but metamorphosize into a device for communication. And the, with the web, that's finally happening. Um, and secondly, it's exciting because Microsoft doesn't own it, and therefore there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening. So I think uh, that the web is going to be profound in what it does to our society. As you know, about 15% of the goods and services in the U.S. are sold via catalogs or over the television. All that's going to go on the web and more. Billions and billions, soon tens of billions of dollars worth of goods and services are going to be sold on the web. If you could th A way to think about it is it is the ultimate direct-to-customer distribution channel. It, another way to think about it is the smallest company in the world can look as large as the largest company in the world on the web. So I guess um, I think the web, as we look back 10 years from now, the web is going to be the defining technology, the defining social, uh, um, the defining social moment for computing. And um, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's breathed a whole new generation of life into personal computing, and um, I think it's going to be huge. Yeah. And you're making software that... Oh, absolutely, but so is everybody. I mean, just yeah. forget about what we're doing. Just yeah. As an industry, the web is going to open a whole new door to this industry. Yeah. It's another one of those things that it's obvious once it happens, but five years ago, who would have guessed? Right. That's right. Isn't this a wonderful place we live in? Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks. We are broadcasting live from Brooklyn, where left is best, as it is everywhere else. Greetings to comrades and friends opponents and enemies with me as always super producer matt leck salutations <laughs> head theoretician david grishkum how's it going don't miss old austin super producer david slavic he is roaming the discord the digitosphere plotting and scheming alongside the growing tmbs universe on this week's program h bomber guy he is one of the funniest people on YouTube, and he has a distinct insight into why this ecosystem of ours has gotten so, so, so polluted with so many virgin fascists. Sorry, couldn't resist. Pardon me, incels. And then, but not the good incels. We're only calling out the bad incels. That and much, much more with H Bomber Guy. Then, Corey Pine, he's crew. He's a brilliant journalist, and he's author of the essential new book just released this week, Live, Work, 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 Die, A Journey into the Savage Heart of Silicon Valley. What does that industry have in mind for the rest of us after all of the damage and delusions that they have already caused and perpetuated? All that, plus a special pyramid edition with crew Anoa Changa, as she was smeared by one of the biggest pieces of hack journalism to come out of NPR since every episode of Planet Money. Ooh, I did it. We're on Michael Brooks' show. But first, this past weekend was Earth Day, and I'm going to do a necessary cliche at this point and read you some statistics on the state of our global ecology sea levels are expected to rise between 7 and 23 inches that's 18 to 59 centimeters by the end of the century and continuing melting at the poles could add between 4 and 8 inches that's 10 to 20 centimeters 
hurricanes and other storms are likely to become stronger. Floods and droughts will become more uh, common. Rainfall in Ethiopia, where droughts are already common, could decline by 10% over the next 50 years. Less fresh water will be available. Um, if the uh, ice cap, the uh, Kualo, oh my God, Kulakai, Kulakai ice cap in Peru continues to melt at its current rate, it will be gone by 2100 leaving thousands of people to rely on it, uh, who rely on it for drinking water and electricity without a source of either. Some diseases will spread, such as mosquito-borne malaria. Uh, think the 2016 resurgence of the Zika virus. Ecosystems will change. Some species will move further north or become more, and, and will become more successful. Others won't be able to move and could become extinct. Wildlife research scientist Martin Obert has found that since the mid-1980s, with less on ice on which to live and fish for food, polar bears have gotten considerable, considerably skinnier. Polar bear biologist Ian, uh, Ian Sterling has found a similar pattern in the Hudson Bay. He fears that if sea ice disappears, the polar bears will as well. So these are the snapshots, and there's many, many others that we can add to the usual litany of the fact that we are destroying the basic living systems upon which life on this planet, certainly human life, depends. And it's very important to anchor this conversation in a broader one about capital, decommodifying the commons, the core class struggles and doing things like destroying the oil conglomerates, which have massive power over our collective energy, political, strategic, and global lives. This is fundamental. And we're going to do that in a couple of different ways. One, let's identify the two, many, two primary responses that we have in the world today in terms of governance. And like many other areas, we have one area which is fatally flawed and insufficient, but radically better than the other. Let's take Jerry Brown versus Donald Trump. Jerry Brown is the governor of California. He's a popular governor, and he's an interesting governor, and he's a smart guy. He's also a, center le a centrist neoliberal who is doing something that is actually fundamentally incoherent. He warned last week that global warming could lead to 3 billion deaths. He's talked about the fundamental uh, ethical challenge of driving an economic system which fundamentally can and will and does destroy life at its root. He's been incredibly aggressive on things like deployment of post-carbon technologies, as well as market-based trading schemes, some of which have produced real results in California, and make no doubt about it, technology and innovations in those regards are going to be an important part of any solution, including a broadly democratic and socialist one. At the same time, he's continued to push for natural gas exploration. He's a friend of the oil industry in drilling and exploration. So he's followed as all other mainline politicians, including Macron and others, a somewhat contradictory path between striking a match for the future, at least in terms of technology, but not questioning the sort of dying fossil fuel technologies, which are still eating away the earth costing lives and a clear and present danger to all of us. Not to mention not questioning the fundamental strategic threat that the fossil fuel industry poses to all of us from Exxon to Saudi Aramco. Then, of course, we have Trump. We have the Republicans. We have this neo-populist uh, sort of pseudo-populism, which spreads lies about science, is entirely in the pockets of industry, and is doing its best to accelerate the, the destruction of our global ecology. Those are the poles. We need to move to something broader while recognizing that while totally flawed, the Jerry Brown model is significantly better than the Donald Trump model. And this is the tension that we have to balance as we push forward the radicalism we need while recognizing distinctions inside the relative world that we occupy. You see this across the board. That in terms of identifying the different threat levels that we face in our politics. But ultimately, 
The real answer to this is going to be a radical project of decommodification. And in this sense, decommodifying the commons, taking oil and natural resources out of private hands is no different than what we need to do with housing, what we need to do with healthcare, what we need to do with pharmaceuticals. We need to re-democratize and reclaim vast, vast swaths of all human activity if we are to survive as a species. And the reason we want to survive as a species is because, well, absolutely, we have an ethical obligation to all species and the global ecosystem at large, there's no doubt about it. But we also need to anchor an environmental ethic and a desire for human flourishing. This isn't separate from our broader goals of justice and well-being for all humans. We're not talking about just folding into the woodwork here. And I want to just mention two things that fit in with that. Peter Fraze, who will be on this show soon, wrote a brilliant book called The Four Futures, which was based off of an essential essay that he wrote for Jacobin by the same title. And he outlined four different scenarios that human beings can go down. And I'm going to give you the first two really briefly. The first is egalitarianism and abundance, communism. And he writes, I'm going to quote now from Peter Fraze, there's a famous passage in the third volume of Capital in which Marx distinguishes between a, a, quote, realm of necessity and a, quote, realm of freedom. In the realm of necessity, we must, and now he's quoting Marx again, wrestle with nature to satisfy our wants to maintain and reproduce life. And back to phrase, by means of physical labor and production. This realm of necessity, Marx says, exists in all social formations and under all possible modes of production, presumably including socialism. Now back, and I'm going to continue with phrase. What distinguishes socialism then is that production is rationally planned and democratically organized rather than operating at the whim of the capitalist or the market. For Marx, however, this level of society was not the true objective of revolution, but a merely a precondition for the, quote, that the development of human energy, which is an end in and of itself, the true realm of freedom, which, however, can blossom forth only with this realm of necessity as its basis. And he goes on to talk about how, and it is true, that there is a rapid development of technologies, which actually, if they were governed democratically and deployed correctly, could radically reduce the work week. They could radically expand human freedom. And the fundamental misalignment and terrifying market-based error that we make, that we create artificial commons and scarcity where none exist in the world of technology and innovation, and then we treat the earth systems as if they are infinite when in fact they are finite. That fundamental error can lead to both ecological collapse and the type of dystopian tech future that Corey will be talking with about with us briefly. So this is a vision that says harness those technologies to liberate humans from labor, to democratize economic systems and radically free up what we can do with our time, and by the way, the different forms of hierarchies and competitions that we choose to engage in democratically. Nobody who's talking about these post-capitalist scenarios are talking about getting rid of competition. As an example, everybody needs healthcare, not everybody needs to win an NBA championship. Nobody's talking about that, and Phrase makes that distinction uh, very well. Now, the next scenario, and this is still on the abundance level, when we get to the scarcity level, that's where things uh, are terrifying and limited in their own way, but that's for another day. Hierarchy and abundance, and that is rentism. And I'll just quote now from Phrase, and we can see this perfectly encapsulates the tech model that Silicon Valley is giving all of us. Suppose, for example, this is Peter Phrase from The Four Futures in the Jackman. Suppose, for an example, that all production is by means of Star Trek's replicator. In order to make money from selling replicated items, people must somehow be prevented from just making whatever they want for free, and this is the function of intellectual property. A replicator is only available from a company that licenses you the right to use one since anyone who tried to give you a replicator or make one without their own repli replicator would be violating the terms of their license. What's more, every time you make something with a replicator, 
you must pay a licensing fee to whoever owns the rights to that particular thing. In this world, if Star Trek's Captain Jean-Luc Picard wanted to replicate his beloved T, Earl Grey Hot, he would have to pay the company that has copyrighted the replicator pattern for hot Earl Grey tea. Now, this is an important distinction because IP laws have come to sort of mean, you know, the way they've been deployed, the critiques of them in the Silicon Valley have come to sort of mean don't pay artists for their work, but let these platforms that exist parasitically and in closed commons to operate without any sort of systems of public accountability and, in fact, to pursue incredibly strict IP with regards to their own products and services. If we can frame environmental scarcity and the environmental crisis in the context of creating a broader abundance and harnessing and democratizing and socializing technology so that it can wean us off of burdening the earth and into a broader project of decommodification, we can take environmentalism into the solid ground of democratic socialist active action and seamlessly integrate what needs to happen ecologically with the highest aspirations that we have socially and economically. So, and uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. I, uh, I'm still going, and I guess that's my way of saying I will still be taking many showers. This is... <laughs> um, all right, let's get to the shout-out, guys. Uh, so... Uh, there was a big New York DSA meeting uh, last week. Uh, you know, I don't always go for this type of thing, but uh, look, fuck Milo, Yaba, whatever, I do. Fuck him. Fuck everything he represents. Here he is at some place, I think it was on the Upper East Side. Uh, Midtown, the Mid Churchill or something. Midtown, like the Churchill, which, which I have to say, PSA Milo has... belongs there. Yeah. I don't know about my DSA <laughs> friends, but uh, but they, they got the job done and they... Uh, they got this forgettable prick out of the restaurant. Nazi scum, get out! 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 He just looks like such a loser. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Nah, 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 nah. Uh, so well done. I'm. It's not usually my jump, but as I say, fuck Milo. Uh, next time, like maybe everyone just mutter Nazi, 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 Nazi. Yeah, do it. Make like, it funny. Let's yeah. Let's figure out ways to make Nazi? this like it's great. Pedophile apologist. Like, what? Fundamentally, the goal was achieved. Like, yeah, fundamentally, the goal was achieved. Like, That's why it's the shout out. No doubt. Um. Guys, just want some style points. That's what TMBS is for. Well, well, they did buy everyone at the bar around afterwards. That is well fucking done. Redistributing the wealth. New York DSA friends. Hell yeah, I love it. That's like that's like a good that's like in a western. Like when you get the bad guy out of the bar and you're like, all right, folks. The doors are still swinging. Yeah, the saloon yeah. doors. <laughs> that's round on me. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. All right, guys, before we, uh, you know, talk about the many, many reasons why you should uh, become a patron of TMBS, I want to talk about this briefly. A patron of the show and a woman who uh, we've known for a while um, through Majority Report, Teacher Lauren, she's in upstate New York, she's an educator. Um, her mom uh, is in a process, and, and we have a link to it, it's, uh, and it's up on screen now. Uh, we'll have a link to it in the blog post. It's a GoFundMe. Um, I can't, the lighting is too much to read it from here. But um, she's basically, uh, it's a please support Miriam. And I'll just read briefly. Early this year, my mom was diagnosed with Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease. As a result, the inflammation around her eyes have severely impaired my mother's vision, and she cannot drive or work for the foreseeable future. This illness, illness has transformed my mother's life, and she's devastated by the loss of her sight. She's already had two surgeries to save her sight, and the third one is scheduled. Her recovery can take anywhere from six months to two years. In the meantime, I need your help to keep food on the table and a roof over her head. No amount is too small, and every penny will go to helping my kind, loving mother. 
Um, you know, I, I found out about this, I think, over the weekend and donated immediately. The goal is $4,000. We're um, They're already halfway there. Um, so, yeah, seriously, donate whatever you can. And, uh, you know, this is like the voluntary mutual aid society that we uh, are a fundamental building block of all the politics we care about. And, of course, this is also an indictment of the just grotesque, immoral, disgusting system of healthcare we have in this country that this isn't, of course, free and universally provided for, and this is even a question. Um, it's, you know, an, as every other, you know, just unending indictments of this disgusting capitalist healthcare system we're in. But if you can, um, please do uh, join me in supporting uh, this, uh, this effort. Um, we're already at uh, 2,097 as of this recording for a 4,000 goal. So I wanted to uh, put that up front. All right. Do a little, little pitch. Um, guys, uh, we are almost at uh, 1,300. The next big uh, goal is 2K uh, patrons. And when we do that, we will, uh, as I say, we're going to have much more regular animations. The next one is coming up soon, so don't worry. We're not waiting for 2,000. There's the Glenn Beck Food Bucket Challenge, <laughs> which is coming. And also at 2,000, we're going to play around. It, it, it's not going to be inbuilt yet, uh, but there'll be a little bit more sort of uh, content. Not on a you know regular inbuilt basis yet, but a little bit more. Um, and, uh, you know... Beyond that, what we're already doing and what you are already sustaining and building out is incredibly impressive and important. I mean, first and foremost, with the content um, and the illicit history series, uh, the post games, the theory readings, the videos. I mean, this is really the goal of a, you know, entertaining, engaging, but also seriously thoroughgoing um, wide-ranging polymath but also practically actionable political education we're doing it and uh, people are taking a lot from it and we're incredibly proud of that so you should join that and get the whole experience as soon as possible then there's this amazing discord community which has the uh, home care action uh, in California which we're going to be doing a segment on soon this is also a major spearhead of that really important GoFundMe we just talked about so when you join in, you're uh, sort of getting into um, free, independent, uh, the sort of free of influence, independent content of the future. You're in a serious community and there's a lot of opportunities to engage with each other and uh, actually certainly with me um, in terms of uh, calls and uh, Discord Q&As and... Uh, a lot of other things. It's an ongoing, serious, in-depth engagement. We're passionate, we're serious about it, and we're on it. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Patreon.com slash TMBS. It's time. We'll be right back with H Bomber Guy. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now, and this is, well, everything on the show is special, but people have been asking me, and I think asking him, to do this for quite some time, and I'm very excited about it. H. Bomber Guy and I are about to dunk on horrible YouTube. 
Oh, oh, is that what is that what you want me for? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I prepared all these notes. I prepared are to do with the Star Wars prequels. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, this is well, not. This is not my. That is not my wheelhouse, brother. Oh no! You could have told oh. me that star that that you know star that like like it's like Spock's origin story, and I would be like, mm-hmm. Okay, hold on a sec. I just the, the thumbnail just just updated for me. I, I'm watching the stream as well, and the picture you chose for me is wonderful. I you actually found a good looking picture of me. That's really hard. Well done, guys. I'm not yes. in control of that. I want to thank my team, but I I don't agree. Good. <laughs> oh good. no, no. I mean, in terms of it being a hard to find a picture, <laughs> that sounded really bad. <laughs> it's a horrible picture. What are you talking about? All the pictures of you were great. I'm happy to announce my last appearance on the Michael Black show. <laughs> That's it. <sighs> yeah. Well, no, you've been you've been on a soy regimen. You're looking great. Well, we did find this I'm... from a Davis Arini Twitter thread. Actually, <laughs> I looked it up and I really? almost didn't use it because of that reason. I thought maybe like the only source for this is the right wing on Twitter. I might be not shouldn't use it, but it was um, one of the better pictures of you. So yeah, I think there's plenty that's, of good pictures. That's amazing. What is he just tweeting pictures of me now? That's amazing. He had me blocked for like three years, and then he unblocked <laughs> me to be like, I see you're very upset with my work. You should stop being so upset. It's like you blocked me for three years because I laughed at. The skull in your bedroom, like uh, you know, this is this is this one? is actually okay because you know here's the problem. There's a big range of people that watch and listen to this show, and there's going to be a chunk of people, mm. including unfortunately myself, who are like, "Oh yeah, Jesus Christ, that guy! I know exactly who you're talking about. That's terrifying oh. and funny, and oh, yeah. we're not going to survive as a species." But oh, then yeah. there's a whole other group of people that you know, luckily for them, they're like, "Who the hell is that guy?" Who's and I think because we're yeah. starting, we're starting like on the deep end of YouTube yeah. moron. So let's let's go back from the beginning. And I'll try to <laughs> Jesus Christ, we got to put that guy's picture on. We have on the screen. thread up that it had that picture in and it was from a Davis Serini uh a Photoshop of you in the banana costume where it says this is H Bomber guy right now. This is where a life of soy leads you. So he's still on that That's soy fantastic. Those soy jokes never get old. Um, wow, that banana costume was actually um like that was from so long ago. I don't think I'd ever tried anything soy related at that point in my life. Uh, I'm actually drinking a coffee with soy milk in it right now. Uh, so oh I guess there's no going back. You're literally going to war with your testosterone right now <laughs> as we speak. Um, so before we get, because as I say, I think like this guy is really like, I think, you know, most people, unfortunately, like they've probably encountered, you know, Dave Rubin or whatever. So we'll get, but when you get to Davis Arini, that's when you're really like, in the, you know that you've just been like involuntarily red pilled, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so. So, um, how did YouTube become so right wing? Gosh, well, there are so many um, valid explanations for that that I don't even know where to start. Um, but I have a couple of specific things. Um, I don't know. Are we allowed to dunk on liberalism uh, on the show? Are, you are we allowed kidding? to be mad at Hillary Clinton? Is that okay? Are you crazy? You know what? You've really shown your hand here of how little you've watched, buddy. Do I have permission? You have beyond. You have you have obligation. All right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things that I think goes unignored um, because it's inconvenient for a lot of people who don't feel particularly left wing is. Um, liberalism's slow sort of slide towards the right and its mm -hmm. sort of inability to uh, solve the, the problems that it creates. Yeah. So yep. um, essentially we've, we've just come out of a couple of decades of what people thought of as the left not being particularly left wing and supporting ideas that make things harder for people and make people less interested in um, trying to solve the problem because the the party that's supposed to be supporting them sucks yep. and leaves a lot of people feeling unrepresented and you know a lot you know I I don't like saying oh you know all right wing people are just you know misunderstood people who weren't given a voice or whatever I don't fully accept that but I think that if there had been a left wing party that was good that would certainly have helped. Uh, provide an alternative. I think it's the same analogy. I mean, I've used this analogy with regards to talking about terrorism, right? So it's like if there is, you know, there are, like as an example, there is a distinct Salafist ideology as an example. It's real. It's self-generating. It, it isn't sort of dependent necessarily on other variables. And obviously in, in a Western context, in an American context, you know, racism or in the, is, is an example is in the DNA of the country. 
And now that being said, if you, you know, these are pathogens and if you weaken the immune system, it opens, you know, more opportunities for these infections to spread. And when exactly. you have, and you know, is, democratic exactly and center left right. politics that don't do anything on class on inequality that are sort of just like, oh, well, we'll equip you with the skills to deal with these totally unjust systems we've created. Um, obviously, you're going to open up a lot of disenfranchisement and frustration across the board. Mm. That's that's definitely the case. I mean, especially with the Middle East, you have what is effectively the systematic destruction of all the left-wing groups yes. that exist there. And then you have liberals wondering why uh, why everyone there seems to hate them and why there's so much support for all the other groups that they you know helped put there. And then Sam Harris uh, is like, it's because of the Quran. Yeah, it's because yeah. the Quran. Yeah, bad. I read a yeah, poll. Of course. And then you go... Yeah. Yeah, but what about the destruction of the left-wing groups that the CIA helped uh, fund across the region? He goes, that is irrelevant. You're taking <laughs> me out of context. I love the way he says irrelevant. It's just, <laughs> you can tell that it's what he means is, I hadn't I hadn't thought of that. And uh, one of my favorite things, if you ever watch debates with Jordan Peterson, is he'll say like, we'll, we'll get to that if we have time. And then it just, you know, never happens. <laughs> wait, wait, can you get, what's a good, that's amazing. What's a good example of that? Um. There's a, there's a uh, debate he just did with Matt Dillahunty, who is one of, like an atheist debate superstar guy who is cool and I think like has developed a lot himself over time. And, uh, and he did one for – let me just find it. Let me just uh, – I had I have it saved somewhere so I can even say what channel it's on. Um, one sec. It's okay. Who, no, um, no need to Pang, promote uh, – Pangburn Philosophy. It's an unlisted video. Uh, I'm just kidding. Like Penguin Center. Philosophy? Anyway. Pangburn philosophy, yeah. It's okay. a debate with Matt Dillahunty, Jordan Peterson. Dillahunty keeps making like really interesting points that Peterson clearly doesn't have a response to or had not thought about until that moment. And finds he keeps finding clever ways to not have to respond. Um, it's like that. And like Harris is also a master of of that. Well, Harris yeah. will say, like, as an example, if he, he goes, he goes, he goes, I do take... It's like... What these people never learned is just because you name something doesn't mean you're taking it into an al into account, right? So it's like yeah. if we were to flip it and we were to say to Jordan Peterson, like, oh, no, 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 like Jungian archetypes are super important. I've included that in my analysis. And then we completely ignored <laughs> them through every thread of what he, we were saying. That would bother him. Same mm -hmm. with what these, so like Sam Harris, like, no, I know those things are matter. And then he ignores them categorically. I think now he's, I, I, I think Harris has kind of shown his hand now with with like he's getting much more overt which is that i only want random decontextualized stats that reinforce my you know cult base and you know whatever my sort of hobby horse is and that's it and i actually find every other form of human knowing invalid i think you're right peterson still does like oh no we, we can get to that but anyways you know yeah. we gotta, because girls are bitches I've really come around on uh, Harris and Richard Dawkins's sort of approach where like I would sort of agree with some of their points and I would go along with that and my excuse for people who found what they were saying kind of kind of awkward would be well they are very science oriented people you know and, and for most people science is a tool in the toolbox and these people are dedicated to it so they're not going to be as good at the other stuff but in retrospect like it's not that hard to give a shit about people like you could also do that as well. And I think it's also, you know, I think exactly, you could also give a shit about people. And I think if we look at the history, and you got to tell me, but it's like, I, you know, I was not, I guess I came, because some of these people got started like in like 2007, 2008 on YouTube, right? And I didn't have any, yeah. I didn't even start working around YouTube in any capacity until like 2012 and, and didn't really start appearing myself until like 2013 or 14. And so I came at it with like, you know, I'm on a left wing show and part of my portfolio now that I'm being on air is is doing some, you know, foreign policy stuff. So, OK, so, uh, you know, Sam Harris wrote something just egregiously stupid on foreign policy. I don't really care about the atheism stuff one way or another, but I do have a problem with like convoluted torture thought experiments. <laughs> and these people, you know, and, and then you realize like there's this, you know, these cults at you who will harass you all day about this stuff. But. What really struck me was it wasn't it was that they weren't caring about people and that they weren't it was like an ideology of science which wasn't scientific if that makes sense it was sort of like you know 
stats does not science make, right? If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I, I that's something like I've um had a lot of conversations with a lot of people who are on like the other side of of, of this discussion we're having. Yeah. And the the sad thing is for a lot of these people it's basically professional wrestling. Like they they they're jousting with the idea of being factual. Like they don't really have um they don't they're not really invested in being right so much as in um winning whatever is currently the argument of the time and getting attention. Uh, and that's the, like it's especially shocking because this stuff does affect people's lives and it affects how they look at the world and their politics. And yet to the people who are actually like negotiating, um, creating those feelings, it just doesn't matter. And that's, that was like, it's tremendously cynical. And I think that's one thing that puts me off of like, I, I used to make uh, more fun of specific people. And now it's like, I don't even want to talk about them anymore because they, they don't actually care about what they're talking about. Yeah. And I do. I'm going to be accused of virtue signaling there, but like I think it is good to care. So yeah, he'll, oh well. he'll say that he cares, which is total virtue signaling. Yeah. Um, I do. So what was what, was it in those trends? Like if we saw it of like on YouTube, it seems like the the kind of three ingredients that at least I could pick up on were, you know, the video game uh, stuff, which you know. I, I've actually covered gaming a little bit more on this show. I'm not a gamer, but I've been learning about it more as a community. And it's not necessarily like I don't get why gaming needs to be a reactionary thing, but it does seem to be primarily that on YouTube. And then hmm. pick up culture stuff and then um, atheism stuff. And that sort of congealed and we're the sort of origin point of how YouTube took on this very, very right wing flavor. Yeah, it's to do with a lot of things. Like, um, it's to do partially with sort of political illiteracy. Like, right. a lot of folks don't really know that much about politics or about what's going on in the world, um, and they have their own sort of very limited view of 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 the world they live in, and that can feed into coming to conclusions that are, in the grand scheme, completely bizarre. Um, but that's and that's the thing with with gaming culture. You have a lot of very young people. You have a lot of people who really are into video games, and that's not a, that's not the best recipe for being well informed on these ideas. Not to say that people who play games are, are stupid. You know, I, I I was just playing Wolfenstein 2, like right when you called me to check that this stuff was going. Um, it actually crashed while that happened. Uh, there's some kind of weird problem with the DLC. Anyway, so um, but uh, like. But that's where it comes from. I remember there's a very funny, hilarious tweet uh, by uh, Ian Miles Chong. Uh, My political stance is pro-consumer, pro-gamer. That's it. And, you know, f um, <laughs> fast, fast forward, you know, two years and he's like, vote for the conservatives or you'll get Corbyn's clown car of commies. It's like, what? Jer Jeremy Corbyn's not even that left wing, you know. Not so, at all. Right, right. He's just a good, basic democratic socialist, which is actually like... A major, I mean, it's especially, it's amazing to me when people do this from Canada or the UK, because I have to say, like, you know, at least in the United States, we can say, like, we really do, like, have the most unmitigated, you know, for a developed country, like, we did throw our healthcare system to the vultures. We did, like, we don't have any of it. Like, we have very few buffers. So particularly when somebody, it's like, I know that you're sitting on your ass with, like, the safety of the NHS or the Canadian Health Service, and you're like... <laughs> bitching about it like you think that you know because you can get health care you can't get a date or something i don't know it's a very it's a very weird thought process but okay so yeah there's a lot of decontextualized you know people don't know that much about politics there's kind of these yeah. trends there's the professional wrestling thing yeah and that it, and that leaves yeah. people in the perfect position to be uh co-opted like something that i yeah. think a lot of uh, the right's big strategy is to effectively reach out to people who don't know that much or are kind of on the fence and convince them that they were secretly on the right all along that's a very sort of it's a pretty insidious tactic but it, it happens a lot like for example um I'm sure we've all seen the political alignment chart, you know, the one where it's like libertarian, authoritarian, uh, left, right, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the one, right? The yeah, grid. Yeah. People have made fun of that constantly. And the left especially makes fun of it because I think it's more obviously bollocks to people who've thought more about politics. Right. Uh, but it, it, there, there's 
I have reason to believe that the person who came up with that particular one was, you know, a libertarian and they came up with it and the questions are kind of leading. So you, you take the test and then you come out, oh, what a shock. I was a libertarian all along. And then, you know, that informs people about, you know, it's that is the sort of thing that you see happening so you see folks like um like ruben coming in and not saying anything particularly special like ruben never said anything um particularly out there or clever or anything except um i have to admit to i have to admit when you, oh, i'm sorry i want you to finish your thought but i have to admit when you say yeah. special and ruben you're really <laughs> triggering a lot of desire to make unwoke jokes which i'm controlling That's, but please well, go ahead um, i apologize for yeah. that but uh he's he's not you know, he, he hasn't said anything that's ever stood out as particularly bad. He's just, you know, been in the right place in the right time to convince a bunch of people that that he's their guy. And th right. you see the same effect happening in reverse, where uh, you can directly quote Peterson or Rubin to people, and they'll say, that can't possibly be a quote. That's not what they meant. Um, right. Because to them, the person, because they, they sort of see this person as an extension of themselves, and they wouldn't say that. Um yeah. And I've had this argument for years. I've argued with libertarians all my life, and they've always been like, "You just haven't read enough Ayn Rand to really get what she was saying with this quote." <laughs> right, right. And usually, in the answer for sane people is like, "I actually read more than enough, and I'm going to regret like one day being on my deathbed that I spent more time than necessary on this garbage." But do you do you think that um, that that's a whole other? there's sort of three things that I want you to get out there. It's so funny when you talk about that, that personality test in politics, let's start there because it, it strikes yeah. me that that's like exactly the point of all of this stuff, because this, this came up, you know, in, um, in like Sam Harris and actually while, you know, Dave Rubin, as he does, he does the down market version of this. He had Stefan Mellon, you down on, and mm. there's also a global conversation about this. There's, it's a rhetoric on the right in, in Europe and this kind of, resurgence of IQ racism and it makes sense because it you know it fits with the preoccupations of the age you know the sort of obsession with um certain types of perceived cognitive performance and you know yeah. in the economy right so yeah they but what strikes me is that you know like Sam Harris's whole defense even from I mean we could take it across the board I'm somebody who still actually is not bought into IQ I get that people have made the argument that the the test has become so much more clean and and it stands outside of culture I I don't buy it I think we can no, still have no. yeah like much more <laughs> yeah. but I'm saying even if you went inside that world and even if you took people like Turkheimer or Flynn who really buy the test and they still are saying that environmental and contextual influences matter. And it just seems to me that what you just said about the personality test, that nails it right there. Because if you have some type of left orientation or even just like a kind of basic critical awareness, you think to yourself, who designed this test? What's their agenda? Why did they set the questions this way? I could probably design my own test and make you a Maoist if I wanted to because I know how to word questions. Yeah, but they just want to go, questions. well, what's your number on this? That's all that matters. And that's the yeah, whole it's thing. It's very easy, yeah. Right. And it appeals to people's desire to feel like statisticians, you know. Right. Um, if, you, you, if you can convince someone that all you have to do is this simple maths to figure out what race should survive, <laughs> then – then they'll, you know, even right. without realizing the horrible implications of what they're reading, they'll feel clever because it's like they've worked something out. And that's the important word. It's like they've worked something out because they haven't. They've is, been they've been fooled. Is that uh, where you think the emotional attachment comes from then? Yeah, I think people have a um, people have a desire to feel like they're objective. Uh, they're not. That, that's a fantasy. But people enjoy being told, oh, look how reasonable you've been um and I, I i don't i don't buy that i think everyone's everyone's got a perspective on things and what matters is the truth and that requires thinking a little bit harder than you know just adding some numbers up uh it, i think it's very telling that like uh, there isn't even a guinness world record for highest iq anymore because the test for people with really high iqs breaks down it doesn't work Right. Like they, they just gave up on it. They're like, we've realized this is this is nonsense. Sorry. And when you know, when the beer company's book of dumb bullshit have decided to strike IQ 
from the record, uh, I think that says a lot. Yeah, that might be a little bit of an indication. So how do you think, and then I, I do want, we did promise dunking, and I know you said you didn't want to talk about specific personalities, but I do have some specific oh, personalities oh, that I'm oh, going to oh, want to get video, to. Oh, in videos, no, but right here, sure. When I'm yeah, oh, yeah, okay, beautiful, thank you. I, I appreciate that, because I am yeah. I am a, a big promoter of a post-fact uh, ad hominem <laughs> world, so oh, that's man. what I represent. Um, every time one of them goes, ad hominem, I go, that's right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. And I say that. I, yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just I got the message from you when you invited me on. You said, "We, you know, no facts. Uh, you know, this is all just doctrine. Uh, be prepared. <laughs> Appeal to this. emotion and yeah. uh, don't use uh, facts. And um, all that matters is history. And um, ad hominems don't care about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that being said, the la the last more kind of serious question I have for you, and I really and I recommend, you know, I know that there there is a lot of overlap, but for anybody who hasn't checked your videos out, uh, please please go check out uh, Harry's videos over at H Bomber Guy because you and I think you know I, I think there's a circle of us that do this in different ways, but I think that you're. There's a whole other set of this stuff that is just purely stylistic and it's tapping into a certain kind of humor and it's tapping into a certain kind of ethos. You do an incredible job, I guess, to, of both elevating the game and beating these people at their own game. So my curiosity for you, and there was this video that came out recently, I'm forgetting the name of who did the video and I have to admit it, it was a little, it was not somebody I'd seen before and the presentation was a bit, bit odd, but it was interesting with actually a prediction that the left will win YouTube. And I'm kind of wondering, like, do you think we're getting better at, you know, it, there were some people a couple of years ago that were actually, they were, they were maybe kind of on the left, but they were really interested in meeting in the middle on certain stuff that they shouldn't have been meeting in the middle on. And I think mm. those of us like me just sort of realized, like, and I think you do this amazingly well. And I think Contra does this really well. It's just like, the appeal is not really on the substance, on the style. You have to meet, you have to kind of have a somewhat appealing, yeah. you know, the sense of humor and the and the sort of reference points for YouTube. And you really nail that in terms of how you take these people apart. So you think there's hope and just kind of different kind of how the content is presented, basically? I think there is, yeah. I think um, I, I do a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff on my channel is about movies. And uh, I think... Uh, the thing I've learned there is that style um, is substance. How you say something yeah. is as much as what you say. Um, and like, while I can't diminish the importance of my work, uh, I'm just kidding. Or, or well, well, you know, <laughs> while I think that, uh, that that people like Sean and ContraPoints have done some really fantastic stuff, and I've I guess I'm okay sometimes. Uh, I think what's really and I'm really is, good all of the time. So oh yeah, yeah, Michael yeah, Brock show yeah, number one. That's but right. uh, the what I think what's really happening is. Um, the right is starting to um, reap sort of the whirlwind that it's sown. That's a weird metaphor. But basically, when you when you invoke the idea of actually thinking about things, when you tell right. people that they're clever and they should think harder, oh, and by the way, here's the answer. The answer is racism. Um, some of those people are going to actually start thinking, and some of those people are going to come to different conclusions. The problem the left have, and this is sort of my my core, you know, this is my core philosophy, I guess. The problem the left have is that uh, the truth is hard and difficult and sometimes boring. Yep. And you, there's a lot of work involved. Like when a problem is systemic, there is so much paperwork involved fixing it. There are so many old laws that have to be changed. There's so much stuff that has to be done. And that is a lot. Yep. Um, the thing that like the, the right wing philosophy boiled down is five words. Wouldn't it be great if... Um, it's, it, they're essentially postulating a reality in which everything is the same, but you can feel better about it. Right. Um, the amount of people of color I've spoken to have said, I wish the biggest problem in the world was that it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, people whining. I wish that the problems didn't exist. There is something inherently appealing about a world where the worst thing that's happening is, is a bunch of SJWs whining about something. If we you were know, in that world, we would be in a utopia. Yeah, I would absolutely love yeah. that the worst problem in the world was me whining. That's fantastic. Right. If love Nelson it. Mandela was just like, we must struggle to make H Mama guys shut up. Stop yeah, being I, I, a pussy cock on YouTube. Yeah, take, 
yeah, take me to the take me to that universe and I'll happily yeah. accept my you know beheading. But unfortunately, <laughs> things are way more difficult than that. Uh, but that's the that's the real appeal of right wing uh, beliefs to me at least. Yeah. Is people would really like for things to be that simple, and the fact that it's not is the reason why the left will win. Um, the truth can't be uh, escaped forever at least until you know um ecological disasters completely and utterly uh, destroy us um but apart from that that's you, you why totally we're, got we're the meaning of my opening commentary nailed it um yeah speaking of which speaking of ecological disasters yeah. there's a film about an ecological disaster causing uh, the rise of uh, fascism in california called uh surf nazis must die uh, which came out in the uh, late 80s and was absolutely awful. And I'm currently trying to get Troma to give me the rights to uh, do a remake of it. So that's uh, just putting amazing. That out there. I want to hear more about that. All right. So b before we go, though, we have to do a dunk on a few people. Uh, sure. okay. One guy that I have not, you've done a lot of work on. I he actually, I'm less familiar with him, but you've really run a, a lot of numbers on and apparently have gotten inside. His feelings care about you. Paul just wants it. <laughs> Oh, Three Arrows as well. Uh, look him up. Uh, someone in the chat just reminded me. They're another great YouTuber everyone should check out. Okay. German great. YouTuber who's fairly new. Check him out. Okay, Three uh, Arrows. Cool. About, and Peter Coffin, I've heard. There, there's a lot of people, obviously. You know, then you got the you know Young Turks, Majority Report. There's a bunch of people. But, uh, yeah, um, uh, zero books. But anyways, yes, uh, Paul Joseph Watson. Talk to yeah, him. Uh, uh, Pajama Man. Yeah, his whole thing is uh, <laughs> he will talk a lot about anything he can co-opt to be... Um, to be a really good talking point. And then the really funny thing is if you take, you know, the neck, when the next piece of actual news comes out, you can sort of hear the, the click in his head when he goes, oh, well, hang on, this is bad for me now. So the, I'm sure everyone here knows about the YouTube shooter. Um, right. You know, a woman brought a gun in and started shooting at people at a YouTube office. And uh, he was all over it, uh, reporting on it. Uh, speculating about its effects and how how just how valid it's proven his his youtube video about how uh, the internet makes you bad although of course not his videos and then of course people started looking up uh, this woman's website right. and on her website is a bunch of paul joseph watson videos so then you know all of a sudden uh, he stopped talking about the youtube shooter in any context how mm. weird how, um, how or, odd yeah or um there's there was the there was the recent um the events in in canada just recently yes. where he immediately was like well why isn't why aren't people saying it's islam why aren't people saying it's and then it was revealed to have no connection i think it might even have turned out to be an accident at this point i'm the not one sure in the canada i think actually it's turning out to be a uh a um incel a incel yeah. And so, yeah, that was that was what I was hearing. I wasn't sure if that was confirmed yet. And I like to talk about these things once they've been confirmed, which is the shocking thing that uh people that, that isn't done here. So he's finally walked it back to. I get at least the lesson here is that people shouldn't jump the gun to and that's um Sean did a whole video on this with the uh with the mosque shooting where people only realize that maybe they should wait for all the news to come out once it turns out that they're not a Muslim. Like right. then there's you wait for more information um and that's 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 all paul does is you report on it before it turns out that it's your fault and then you stop and then you hope that enough people keep 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 on you uh and then you go and then you go this new brain force vitality will <laughs> blah 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 um so <laughs> It's like, it's like and the active ingredient is soy, but we'll, but try not to talk about that. That was pretty amazing. Um, all right, one more one more person. Uh, he's he's much less of a big deal now, though, and I'm not sure I should have done this, but I debated him a couple of years ago. Carl of Swindon, Carl. Uh, oh my God, I'm literally forgetting his name. Sargon of Akkad. What's yeah, up with that yeah. guy? I have no idea. I is I, he done? I don't know what he's up to, to be honest. Okay. Um, I have no idea. I think he's. I think he's doing a, a meetup or something. He's going to like. <laughs> he's having some kind of spa getaway with the liberalists. This fun little group that um, that he's trying to start. I'm not entirely sure what he's up to. The last thing I saw of him a was he was on a spa getaway on... with that guy. <laughs> yeah, okay. you know, I th it was in. It's in Bath Spa, which is just a place, but okay. let's pretend it's a spa. All right, but, got uh, it. The last thing I saw him doing was he was he was googling something in the middle of a video and it was auto completing it was showing his search history and it's like <laughs> massages in Swindon. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and like a bunch of different porn websites and then in the comments he, the top comment is him saying I will never apologize for watching porn like as if we want him to apologize like the thing is it's just funny. I don't uh, I want him to apologize for existing. <laughs> I, want, I want a much much broader set of apologies there. Um 
Harry, this was awesome. I hope we can do it again soon, and I look forward to uh, to. Uh, I'm apparently I'm going to come on your channel, and you're going to play yeah, video wanna, games, I'll and we're going to talk. Play, I'm gonna play Wolfenstein. Uh, did it, oh you yeah you did see that video? Okay, got it, uh, I, got I, it. I, you're really good at it. I've never seen someone die that quickly. It's <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. It's fascinating. Once you figured out how to walk down a hallway, it was all gravy. Yeah, there. it was all gravy from there. I mean, I thought I had a very aggressive technique, which there's something to be said for. Kneecap. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, I, yes. In play. my, I don't know if I did this during the live stream, but in my practicing, I was, I was kneecapping a lot of people, which was pretty awesome. I was <laughs> aiming at the kneecaps. Did, and then, and then I don't know. Oh, we did it. I don't know if you got to the point where I did the reverse story that what sh it was that the the reason it happened was that back then FDR was like, in addition to his four freedoms proposal, he was like. And people's preferred gender pronouns should be respected. <laughs> and then Jordan Peterson like, this is crazy. There's no more freedom. <laughs> and then and everybody's like, whoa, 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 fuck that shit. You guys want to come over and take over? And that's how the Nazis took over the country because FDR talked about gender pronouns. So Yeah, but then, as you remember, the dragon of chaos uh, w w uh, came and destroyed all of the Nazis with the sword of truth. Uh <laughs> The dragon of chaos. Oh my god. Um, yeah. The, this, the this. modern philosopher, the, the you know, the the thinking man's thinking man. Yeah. The guy the guy yeah, and when he's in a quarter, he's either like, We'll get to that later, or just like, I mean, yeah, but you know, fucking A. I mean, you gotta think <laughs> about it. It's literally he would actually be so much more charming if he just said, Yeah, fucking A. I mean, you know like people support Trump and such. <laughs> really, I will get to it later, but on real time with Bill Maher, he really sounded like a valley girl to me at a certain point. Like, I, I've just been thinking about this because like, a lot of people support him. Yeah, so what? A lot of people support a lot of politicians. Yeah, but like their feelings will be hurt and whatnot, which then it was like, wait a second. All of a sudden, you're, you're fucking metamorphosizing into a massive pussy on behalf of fascists <laughs> where everybody else needs to like chin up. God. Yeah, it's, it's it's always fascist feelings these folks are worried about. Why is that? Yeah. It's a little bit odd. Yeah, feelings don't matter unless they're fascist feelings. Uh, H. <laughs> guy, Harry, I appreciate your time. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a million. All right, guys, we're going to take a brief break and get to the pyramid. I don't know. Um, hopefully, we'll be with the Noah. If not, I'll take care of this myself. But we're going to take a brief break. Pyramid, and then Corey Pine has entered the building. He's in a Versace suit. He's really, he's in this new lifestyle. All right, we'll be right back. Good time. I know there's gonna be. Welcome back. Popcon and who? Jamie XX. That's so funny that I, know, of course, I know Popcon, but I don't know the other dude. Joining us now is crew, journalist, activist, host of The Way with Anoa, Anoa Changa, for a very special segment of the newly named Gulag. We have shifted from Pyramid to Gulag. Anoa, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, my love. How are you? I'm a little late. It's okay. You don't love me, but it's all right. I <sighs> want to slide this time. That's what they all say. Um, so you were subject to a profile, and 
I had it in front of me, but basically, what is it? W A B E, um, which is a local NPR affiliate in Atlanta, and mm-hmm. they did a profile of you, which was so disgusting, and so. I mean, I want you to take it from here, but I just want to remember, and I I know you'll remind us, but we talked several weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, about how certain coverage of the Russia story was bleeding into um, basically just racist narratives negating uh, all forms of, I mean, actually every form of activism, but in this case, specifically Black Lives Matter activism. Uh, and then this piece comes along, which was literally could have just been a set piece for our conversation. Talk about it. Well, the crazy thing is when we talked before, we had talked after I wrote the piece in The Nation. Yep. And, um, you know, like, oh, I see you know, uh, Sorry, you guys. I just, I had to log in. I had to log into my conference call. I apologize, everybody. I'm muting it right now. Sorry. But um, we, <laughs> I deserve uh, that one. We, 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 we talked about this after, you know, the, um, the piece I wrote back in November in the nation that was written after in October, the Atlanta journal constitution, which is our regional paper here. wrote the same exact hit piece on Marcus Farrell, who is, um, or who was the actor and outreach director for Bernie Sanders. He was also the deputy campaign manager for Stacey Abrams, who's running for uh, governor here in Georgia. And um, unbeknownst to us at the time, there were several people in the state, including those uh, connected to Stacey Abrams' opponent, who's also named Stacey, who had actually been an RT. So we didn't even know that at the time. We just knew Marcus was being slammed um, based on Eugene Perrier's show, by Enemies Nested, which raised Arizona Radio Sputnik. And folks can have the issues and concerns they have with Russia, Russia-based television programs. You and I have just talked about this on the air. We talked about this offline personally as well. Yep. But we cannot get in the habit of dismissing spaces entirely without looking at the necessity for their, their existence. And I'm not, I'm not passing judgment one way or the other in my own defense in this space of anyone else and what they do with their platforms. I would also would like to say for everyone, could you please, 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 if you're going to lift my name up and lift up my story, stop putting me in tweets with Cassandra Fairbanks and Caitlin Johnstone and Jimmy Dore and all these other people who, if anything, participate in the same economy that leads to the marginalization of black and black and brown people and Word. women like myself doing Word. the work that we do. So this piece was supposed to be a profile, turned out to be some oh, these black people are just stupid Russian stooges. Yep. Um, they, they trotted out some uh, white, older white professor from GW, who it turns out, thanks to Adam Johnson, was fair. We learned that this guy was actually on the payroll of some Cold War era think tank that has a very right-leaning viewpoint. Um, so it was just a whole bunch of tomfoolery, and when everyone saw it and saw my responses to it, I was amazed. Like, I knew you, of course, obviously, Ben, you, I knew folks, like, in our immediate circle would come through, but I was really surprised to see how widespread the support has been, um, and, and then I also was given the opportunity, I wrote about it on my own blog, so if anyone wants, wants to read the very detailed explanation of, of all this from my, from, from my experience, which is based on a largely is what the email I sent to the reporter, and I'm assuming he shared with his editor last Monday, um, to quote unquote fact check. I was sent an email asking a fact check, but it wasn't until Monday, after over a month ago and back and forth about this, that I realized what the focus of their story was actually going to be. Um, but so that's on my Georgia based politics blog, peachperspective.com, and then also Forward published a, um opinion piece for me yesterday. Uh, and oh, I the there forward. may be okay. another piece coming out right. in a larger platform as well. I'll tweet those out, and we'll tweet those out on TNBS. But I, I just want to just add two really quick things. I mean, one, first of all, the way they skewed it, you made this point. They could have, I mean, you've appeared on the BBC. You've appeared on national and highly respected independent news shows. Your writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Nation, and so on. I'm a strong critic of, of uh, Russian outlets, but I'm a strong critic of basically every single outlet for different reasons. And if you really wanted to have a legit, like even if you wanted to take that angle and you have any integrity about it, they could say, why is it that intelligent, informed, sophisticated, and you know, genuinely left-leaning young black journalists and activists 
need to be on a Russian outlet to get a steady platform outside of independent media circles, which, of course, incidentally, they could have mentioned my show. They could have mentioned Ben's show. Um, and well, they, this is all information he knew because this is all this. This came up. I'm gonna stop you right there. So this yeah, came go. up. I mentioned, you know, our collaboration. Yep. Uh, ben, you know, me being on Ben's show, Ben, Ben's a rusty just like me because we've all been, we both have been on Eugene Perrier's show. Eugene Perrier, right. regardless of what people think about Sputnik, Eugene Perrier has um, editorial control over his content, and he has some of the most brilliant um, and intelligent commentary, you know, about the issues that we're, we're dealing with and grappling with right now. But I mentioned you, I've done work with so many different folks, yep. um, and like you said, I've, I've had a piece in The Guardian, I've had a piece in The Nation, um, we also, I've been on BBC, I've been on HuffPost Live, so I, I did an interview back during the election with Joanne Reed, I mean, when she was on satellite radio, so yep. it's, um, it's really interesting that the way, even with narratives like people want to talk to a woman who supported Bernie, so they, they called a Noah. And it's like, no, as my, in my capacity with women for Bernie, and, you know, like the way it's all characterized and framed is, is highly problematic. And it's a very odd focus, particularly since I'm not even the only one in the region down here who has, I'm not even the most high-profile person here who has been on RT. There are people who have been on Ed Schultz's show and other shows on RT. And I'm not advocating that people be tarred and feathered or attacked because they've done interviews where they've had, you know, intelligent commentary. We're not dragging people out on the street for going on Tucker Carlson. You know, nope. I mean, while I was very critical of um, Killer Mike for going on the NRA platform, that was a straight propaganda platform. With, there, was, there was no reasonable expectation. And while there may be some who could argue that I didn't have a reasonable expectation, considering how it was pitched, considering just a, a cursory glance at some of the other pieces that this, this person had written, you know, relatively recently to this, this, this interview, you know, I did not have reason to believe until last Monday that this was going to go completely south. And what I told him was, I was like, you know what? You do what you're going to do. You don't want to listen to me. You don't want to respect, you know, they were like, we will take note of your corrections, but we might not accept them. And it's like, okay, Disgusting. that's cool. And at that point, I was like, you know what? Do you. Do what you're going to do because I have a platform and I'm going to make sure I get heard. And, again, I've been amazed and astonished at the, 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 the level I've been heard the amount of people who are like, wow, this is messed up, people I don't know. And those who are going not only to share space and platform versus a few people who are just using it for their own clickbait, but actually those who are willing to introduce me now into other spaces so that I can have a wider platform. I'm not going to give up on Eugene. I mean, I might not go on certain other shows. It's a case-by-case -case scenario who I actually work with. I'm not like some folks who are like, well, all these people are on the left speaking the truth. So everybody is a, is a truth teller. Nah, you really do need to be critical and look at who you're associating with and who you're dealing with. And I have, there's no shame in my game with being associated with a fine activist and, 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 and real, like I said, real intelligent person like Eugene Perrier. So I get the concern. And, and we even talked about this, bro. Like, we talked about the concerns of Russian-based um, outlets. We talked about so much, including the Cambridge Analytic and the Facebook, and how we're really concerned about the troll economy and interference in elections and misrepresenting you know, information when you look at the larger uh, platform in terms of this whole, this whole digital space and how the campaign, specifically looking at Citizenship for Trump, which was created by Jack Sobiec and all those types of people, how we need to look at all of that stuff, too. Because let's be clear, like this Russian interference uh, uh, influence stuff was a small portion of this overall propaganda um, misinformation campaign that occurred during the election cycle. So we're really about getting out good information to help people understand how to vet what they're seeing better. We got to address all of it and not see just that's exactly so to the nuance around Russia. That's so None smart, but it didn't happen in that piece. No, that's so smart because it's all that's the other that's the other that's the other thing is if you're launching point. I think people who deny all the Russia stuff are just being foolish and not dealing with reality. And then I think conversely, if you don't, if you're overinflating it to a conspiracy theory, you're being fantasy based as well. And if you use it as a launching point to get critical and analytical about platforms, then there's value. Everybody has to make a case by case decision, uh, and that needs to be respected. I go on I-24. I'm not a Zionist. It hasn't, you know, like I say what I think of Israeli actions, and you know. I think on, I think we have to say, um, you know, and, and I say this like I'm super critical of RT and Sputnik, and uh, you know, particularly in certain areas of coverage. But I know wherever you go, 
you're going to not only give intelligent and clear and honest analysis. Like wherever, if Anoa's on my show or Fox Business, she's going to say, you know, the same thing because you're honest, you're clear, you know what you're talking about, and you're on a mission. And the only other thing that I want to add is I just think that like it's, it is so, I mean, we know, of course, we have a white supremacist administration. We know racism and all forms of bigotry are resurgent, but it's also just, just be aware of how these resistance types like, you know, use and discard voices. Because when it's like one second, you know, if it's DNC ta talking point, it's black girl magic. But if it's some hack hit piece to delegitimize an important young journalist, that's part of this, you know, Russia, uh, you know, fever dream. And we need to, you know, get away from all of that and call it out wherever we see it. And of course, like I was always going to have your back, and I'm proud to work with you and be associated with you. So that's the last I'll say. Well, on it. I appreciate that so much. And like I said, I figured, you know, what I'm saying if I needed to scramble, like I'd have a couple. I might have got to like 50 retweets. Like I said, that's different people sharing the stories, the different pieces, and just just hitting them back and really trying to get attention in the NPR. Ben, who is now here locally, we're both here in the metro area, Ben has actually literally been taking time to try and get people on the phone. I think he's even planning to actually go over to the studio. So it's been an amazing, you know, show of support stuff. The only thing I'll say is also, you know, shout out to Mary Angela for holding me down and being that big sis and giving that yes. love. I will, be, I will be stealing David for you. You know, I, I do have a soft spot for, for, for men of a certain height. So I love you very much. I'm late for my conference call. Go for it. Thank you so much for having me on for a, a few. My pleasure. Um, I definitely have to find my way to New York and, and, and so I can kick it in the studio. Love it. All right. See you soon. Thank you, Anoa. Yeah. And love to Mary Angela. So, W-A-B-E uh, of Atlanta, Atlanta NPR affiliate. Uh, let them know what you think. And they are in the gulag. Let's take like a 30-second break and we'll get Corey set up.
one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. A little miscommunication there. Um, Corey Pine is with us. Uh, he's crew. He's author of Live, Work, 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 Die. Corey, we got a lot to talk about, but I got a voicemail a couple of hours before we went on air today, which, I, I don't know, honestly, it, scared, it freaked me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you. I usually take most stuff in stride, but it was addressed primarily to you, and I feel like the best way of sharing it, ironically, maybe the way we could most be protected is by just playing it on air. So, I mean... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. All right, Corey, you're not even on mic yet. <laughs> let's let's play. I'm sorry. All right, let's let's just play back from the beginning because people should hear the whole thing. This was this was uh, chilling. Hello. No one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. Hey, Michael Bra. This is Peter Thiel. <laughs> so uh, you're probably wondering how I got your number or. Uh, or not. Either way, it's a new volunteer program where we just like have everybody's number. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's called Progress. Uh, I know that's something you hate, um, but uh, I'll get to you later and probably bankrupting the entire studio that you broadcast out of, um, but also um, possibly getting some of your uh, blood. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I've heard that you had uh, Corey Pine in studio tonight. And as you know, Corey is one of my enemies. And I see Corey out there riding high with his new book, going to all of the trendy booksellers in Portland and Brooklyn and getting observed and observed in New York Magazine and The Guardian and really enjoying himself. I just want to let you know, Corey, that I haven't forgotten. And I have plans that involve New Zealand, cadavers, blood, the future of media, Mars, and innovation. So enjoy your tour while it lasts. If you're even really in a tour, maybe you're all just in a simulation that I'm already playing in my mind where you all die soon. Have a good show. Bye. <laughs> so, Corey, I was a little disturbed by that. <laughs> Thoughts? Chilling. Chilling, Chilling, Chilling right? Back on free speech. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, the book. We've been talking about your book for like 10 months now. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, I appreciate uh, all of your listeners and you who uh, pre ordered. And, yes, uh, indeed. And all the buzz. Is he close enough to the mic? Oh, get a little bit. Uh, you can pull it. You can pull it towards you. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Let's there do you that. go, bud. There you go. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So go ahead. You were thanking me and the audience. Yeah. You're that all great. Right. Thank you for pre-ordering. The book is out. If you if you actually did pre-order it, it should be at your house now. I pre-ordered uh, the audible version, and actually, it just showed up here. Can you cut to? Uh, oh, nice. I'll, uh, I'll it. Yeah. You can. Uh, well, you can just. If you guys want to just take a break, you can just kind of. <laughs> Hook that through and play twenty minutes. You want to just of play it. twenty minutes? Yeah. Of it. <laughs> the uh, the book, of course, is "Live, Work, 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 Die: Journey to the Savage Heart of Silicon Valley." We were at a reading yesterday, last night, last yeah, night, in Brooklyn, and um, so, I mean, you know, we've talked about this, but let's 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 start again at the beginning. What brought you, like, how did this experiment start? And this book is both like you know, for real economic and te technological analysis and political critique and also like terrifying, anxiety-inducing, but also hysterical in a depressing way, personal narrative. So like, I, what, what got you, you? My projection is that you had the perfect combination of like you were already 60, 70% like, fuck this industry, but you had that 30% of like, maybe I could still figure out how to manipulate this place to make a buck, which was the perfect, perfect synthesis to take this project on. That's, uh, that's very perceptive of you, Michael, <laughs> and I think that's what people value about the Michael Brooks show, <laughs> yes, really, that, that is, is type your of value intuitive in, insight, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's an excellent guess. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go back in time. It was... 
2000, I think I really got into this idea of doing something on the subject in 2012. And at yeah. that point, i pretty sure I had just quit a job at a startup in London, uh, which I, I talk about this experience in the introduction. Um, it got acquired by a Bill Gates company and uh, immediately things started going to hell. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit more? I, yeah, I remember, sure. I remember I mean, reading a, about this. This is one of these really sort of enraging little things. It was. Anecdotes. I mean, uh, yeah. it was a really promising photo news startup called Demotics. It got bought by Bill Gates Corbis Corporation, which right. is an uh, image management company like Getty. I mean, basically, right. they sold, they, they're they gone and they've sold everything to Getty. Uh, and the startup doesn't exist anymore, but we had like 30,000 freelance photographers all over the world, uh, some of whom were in war zones and stuff. Very and they were freelancers we were their agency basically and we right. took a cut and we sold their pictures to you know news services newspapers and stuff uh and you know i was really trying to develop those relationships make sure people got paid more uh you know when we got bought i thought well here comes the windfall right like this is going to be awesome how big is my budget going to be and i th you know the first question i asked was like hey do you think we could get a day rate or maybe some insurance for these people who are out there risking their lives and the answer was oh god no wouldn't it be innovative that's exactly what he said basically <laughs> i think what bill is really interested in is the innovation piece and the disruption piece <laughs> And, you know, I, I learned pretty quick what that meant is how do we screw our customers? How do we screw our clients and our business partners? You know, in right. this case, people were risking their lives. Um, so how do we I, squeeze a margin on somebody in a war zone making in, like, like in $5. Syria, yeah. making like $2 a day, mm -hmm. could, like get kidnapped by literally any faction in the war at any second? The real question is, is how do we drive down the margin of their living expenses? Yeah, so that led to some right. self-reflection and I quit. And then there was a period of um, dissolution, let's say, dissolution. There's a, my pajama years. Or a year. <laughs> it was like a, it was a few months, and I was, you know, I was thinking about going back to writing, and I thought I want to do fiction. And um, I read this interview with, uh, well, it wasn't an interview; it was just a piece of news. Uh, Google had hired Ray Kurzweil to be their director of engineering, and oh, your God. listeners might know that Ray Kurzweil is a futurist. Uh, he's the one. He's the guy who popularized the idea of the singularity, so that we're all going to live inside the computer simul in a simulation one day. Yeah, well, and that was. I, was trying, uh, yeah. I think Peter Thiel is giving you a little Kurzweil reference. Well, there. Thiel is really into this stuff. He's oh, the main totally funder into for it. the uh, Singularity Institute, actually, and the it's, it's Singularity his... <laughs> Institute, uh, which will kill you. <laughs> and I thought, what does it mean that Google hired this? Did they believe this stuff? And I just thought, you know. Based on my experience trying to cover tech companies a little bit, I thought there's no way that I'll ever get access and be able to answer that question as a reporter. So I decided to try it as a novel and whatever, sputtered out to know how to end it. And then I um, I started actually doing some reporting and realized, oh, I, you know, I could make a pretty good run at this. Yeah. Um, and and that, you did. That, it's a great book. Yeah. And, you know, I did a, I did a version of a proposal um, about... Uh, tech and it was much more conventional and and the publisher was like yeah i'm not really into it and and then you know i took some time and i thought okay well just like you said i mean how what would i do if i was in a really desperate situation and i had some tech skills and i could kind of sell ideas and i knew the language you know because i'd done a couple of attempts in the tech industry trying to switch careers out of print journalism which is where i came from and it's sort of tough place it's tough yeah well, it's a tough tough road to hoe so right. i thought oh everybody in tech looks so happy and they're making money and like <laughs> why not me I, I can make some money and so i tried to incorporate that into the book right even though i had sort of developed more of a jaded view um seen how how uh positive what what seems to be good news like an acquisition we're going to grow uh is actually like concealing a whole lot of terrible things um right. you know that aren't in the press release um so i i, I knew a bit that that was going on. And th I, I tried to think of a way to cover the tech industry and expose what I knew and learn about the things that I didn't in a way that would be entertaining and also allow me to cover everything from how does venture capital work? You know, how do startups actually, like how do some of these ridiculous startups get money um, to, yeah, what is the singularity? Start, what do these people actually believe? Well, let's start at those two things. Let's go from the sacred to the profane of Silicon sure. Valley. What are all of these ridiculous startups and how do they get money? And, you know, some of your story in it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll get to mine later. Um, some ridiculous startups. You know, perhaps the most notorious one that I mention in the book is a startup called Klinkle. Um, and Klinkle was really typical. I think uh, Wall Street Journal called it like the epitome of a Stanford-fueled startup. And Stanford is really like the skeleton key to Silicon Valley. I mean, 
Um, this makes I, a very strong case, your book, that Stanford is a much bigger problem than Harvard or Yale. You, you made maybe a, right now, yeah. but yeah. you know, in terms of American history. Well, no, in the zeitgeist. Yeah. yeah well, right um, yeah. You know, as one VC put it to me, if you have a stupid idea and you're talentless and you come from Stanford, you will get funded. I mean, it's that is <laughs> that's how it works. Right. You know, my initial question as a reporter was like, "What makes some companies successful?" And I finally met this guy who just laid it out. You know, we sat and had beers, and he was like, "Look." So, you know, yeah, of course, you know, right. and, uh, you know, that might seem obvious. So how, where do you go from there? Uh, anyway, yeah. Klinkle, uh, yeah. it, it was an idea, um, that really didn't have a product. I mean, they, they, it, it, it actually changed several times. I mean, I think the first time was like mobile payments and then they pivoted to like basically a lottery eventually. Um, and the, <laughs> and the, the CEO founder, I mean, it's almost like too, it's like too much fish in a barrel because, this kid was really obnoxious. I mean, you know, and whatever. I, I try not to pick on him too much because he was, whatever, 19 oh, when okay. his startup blows up. And the person that made it blow up was the president of Stanford University, John Hennessy. And, uh, and, and the faculty that was advising, um, you know, some of these computer science kids and engineers. And uh, it was, I think, the Wall Street Journal called it the largest exodus of students in Stanford history, students and faculty, because all these kids dropped out, some of their faculty left to go work on this startup that nobody really knew what it did, and it was still getting tens of millions of dollars in investment, <laughs> and this kid uh, was the, the public face of it, right. and he was just, I mean, as you might expect, a 19-year-old CEO, Right. I mean, he was, they were just burning money on m moronic, uh, lavish parties, and he was posing like... P. Diddy with like wads of cash and like everything that came out was worse than the last thing. And, but you know, who enabled that? It was, you know, right. it, it's, it's not like, him. No, so he's, he's like, the least blameless person. He's the, doing right. what he was told by his advisors. Right. And the right. president of the university. I mean, they set up this situation and it completely crashed and burned and it was a huge embarrassment. But, and it just kind of got swept under the rug like a thousand other failed startups. So know? they get, so basically, they're, the gold rush of a couple of years ago might have mm. been that, like, there really was, you know, just endless gobs of money being thrown around at questionable concepts. And now the impression that I got from your book is that the money's a lot tighter in Silicon Valley. I think that's right. But on the other hand, it it is like the quality control hasn't gone up. It's just purely, like, it's just pure networks. It's like, well, if you went to Stanford and you have a stupid idea... We still might be able to help you out. Networks, but also the kinds of ideas that are getting funded. Yeah. They've really narrowed it down to what are the most um, what are the most evil things that we can think of. <laughs> I mean, that's what's going to get the money. I mean, the key right. is like how, uh, it's just like I learned in my own experience. How can we squeeze workers? Yep, that's innovation and disruption. How can we squeeze people? How can we squeeze our clients? How can we squeeze our employees? How can we squeeze the public, our users, whoever is supplying our labor, um, whoever is supplying materials? Like, just down the line. I mean, and uh, the other piece, um, you know, actual tech innovation. I mean, those are things that are not actually getting funded anymore. Right. I mean, that's why you're seeing things like Juicero, you know, <laughs> the, ju the juicer machine, yeah. the proprietary juicer machine that only takes a certain kind of packet that you can actually squeeze with your hands. <laughs> You don't even need the seven hundred dollar machine or however much it was. Right. Um, I also like Blood Juicero, which was the uh, it was the Holmes. What was that? The um, Theranos. Oh uh, yeah, Theranos. Well, yeah, that was Blood Juicero. And so how did I mean that was did, totally Blood Juicero? How did that happen? So Except I, Juicero, like, actually was a thing. I mean, it was a ridiculous yeah. thing, but I guess if it was really, if it was really Theranos, then it would be like it literally didn't even work as a juicer. <laughs> like, because Theranos was just like straight up like. Yeah, we we've got this revolutionary testing of uh, blood testing method, except like not. Yeah, and that one was very illustrative <laughs> too. I mean, because yeah. you know Henry Kessinger like is a, was on the board. I think I think Mattis. I I, I to, you might want to fact check that, yeah, but I think I think that. Mattis um, was on the board. If you told um, me that Henry Kissinger was on the board of like literally anything negative, I would believe that. <laughs> You're just like, yeah, uh, like Henry Kissinger. You know, there's a glowing profile in the New Yorker about Elizabeth Holmes. Not just them, but right. I, I, you know, it was like she was a wonderkind, you know, and she wore a black turtleneck. It's a, she's like oh, the female Steve Jobs, right. exactly. Yep. And that was a very yep. conscious decision. And right. how come? And this is a question I get at and try to answer in the book. It's like, how how did that slip by? How did all these things like that slip by? Uh, was there no uh, no 
tech press? I mean, we know there's a tech press. Well, what do they do? I mean, they rerun press releases and they, they kind of angle to get break into the, the industry themselves eventually. Right. Um, it's, they, uh, the, the, it's, the, it's, the impression I got of the tech press from reading you, oh, God, this is Ivanka. <laughs> Ivanka. Drink that juicero. Oh, wow. Ivanka Trump tweeted out, this is in uh, 2000, March 2016, daily cold press juice. We can make it at home. Yes, please. And then a click a uh, link to Juicero with hashtag healthy at Juicero, hashtag Juicero. How did I miss that? And now that guy's selling, raw, he's the raw water guy. He yeah, pivoted he's to raw water. But I kind of like raw water concept because if you want to give a bunch of these people diarrhea, good for you. Yeah. Or, you know, like yeah, if you want to like basically sell, like as far as I understand, is literally just like untreated whatever water. It's yeah. like th th that's the problem. You, you shouldn't literalize reading Nassim Talib too much. You know, I, like with a slice of fancy in a Nassim Talib book that makes you feel tougher while you fly in a plane should probably not be. Uh, uh, I'm sure that that's where because Nassim Talib said in one of his books, like when he goes to India or something, he takes a drop of like local water to like toughen his immunity. And I have no doubt, I'm, I would bet all of my assets that that guy read, such as they are, which is nothing. I didn't follow him. He's, he's I, kind I of would, crazy. I, I would imagine that that guy. <laughs> so what uh, is the singularity? The singularity is the moment when... And do they actually believe it? Yes, 100%. Uh, it is a religion of Silicon Valley. Right. It, the singularity, uh, Ray Kurzweil didn't invent it. It was another, um, well, it was a real sci-fi writer named, uh, I want to say, Werner Vinge. Uh, and it, uh, there's a generic term for singularity. It's like a mathematical term where, I don't know, I'm not good at math. But uh, anyway, yeah, it, we the don't technological like singularity yeah. is this idea that uh, because computer processor speeds are increasing uh, supposedly on an exponential rate, although that really hasn't been true in recent past, um, that eventually... Uh, very soon, like when within the next 20 years, like, uh, you know, AI will just sort of emerge <laughs> out of its own accord. It'll just happen. It'll just happen. And, and we'll, by then we'll be cyborgs because it's just going to get that much cheaper and we'll all be connected and we'll be a hive mind, a literal totally. hive mind. Just and cyborgs. then we'll leave our bodies behind and upload ourselves into the cloud. Uh, and then, um, you know, our, uh, the intelligent, uh, super connected, unified cosmic AI will uh, learn how to rearrange matter, so our consciousness will infuse the entire universe, and it's the destiny of the universe. Okay. That we become machines that... Uh, so this is like basically... all creation and like, live forever and have whatever we want, whenever we want. So this is... Because it's also funny because, you know, uh, uh, Deschardins, Teilhard Deschardins, right? He was a uh, French uh, Catholic priest, and I think he was a paleontologist, and he wrote a book... Which actually, I think, got him like you know, internally in trouble for a while. I forget what it was called, but it was basically a, um, you know, he it was an argument that that not only shouldn't the church be opposed, that not only should the church be fine with evolution, but that there was an evolutionary directionality to the human community, and that it was a sort of greater degrees of complexity, and it would end in this sort of new sphere, which is pre-internet idea mm, of like, yeah. but what he was, and actually uh, Marshall McLuhan was influenced by him, and ideas like Global Village were influenced by Teilhard de Chardin. But in his conception, and we could, you know, still very idealistic, but he was saying like, it's going to be a place of basically like, we're evolving to like global love, basically. Like global empathy, that's the point. Yeah. So when I heard this, I was like, these guys sort of like, ripped that idea and then literalized it in technology and then stripped the ethics out of it. Yeah. Like we're evolving towards a new sphere where everybody will just sort of like privately fulfill their narcissistic desires in terms of like whatever nano bits and we're whenever in. there's a counter example they just wave it away. Right. And like, you know it's a good example of that. Oh boy. Um oh here you know one of my favorites is um the issue of uh pollution like oh, And yeah. so here's here you know I do I did I did spend a little time critiquing Kurzweil and and you know he's not the only one that makes this argument. I, you hear like this is basically like Stephen Pinker's argument. Yep. The idea is that um because technology is destined to go on this uh exponential upward curve that uh it doesn't matter what we do now in terms of like uh, using non-renewable resources and destroying the planet because what's imperative is that we keep capitalism going as fast as possible, give the tech companies whatever they want because pretty soon 
it's inevitable they'll invent nano robots that will be able to go back and just clean everything up and restore yeah. the earth to pristine condition. If we don't, if we regulate, then Uber won't solve AIDS. Exactly. Yes. Now this is, you get it. Now, now get it. I'm finally thinking. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, thinking like an entrepreneur. Well, that was the other thing that really struck me about this book, which is that you could read it, and and this is another amazing thing that you pulled off because it is a personal narrative. It's very entertaining. It's very funny, and it's very depressing. But it's also like, to me, it was like a condensed history of capitalism in one industry. You have every, like, it's a totally publicly created commons. It's government-funded innovation. To the extent there's private enterprise, it's completely on the margins of a publicly government-funded commons. Then it's a privatized commons. And now we're in the part where we have to just, like, generate nonsense needs to keep the growth to going. keep the growth going yeah and is I, that... that's i mean that's nice i didn't even think about it that way but uh yeah you make me sound a lot smarter than i was where uh <laughs> gotcha i should have ran that by you before the show <laughs> no, like, it's... well that's exactly the intention <laughs> <laughs> no but i mean seriously because that because that to me like and, and then this incredible mismatch where that ideology that you can't regulate because of this techno utopian fantasy of Google and Kurzweil and Pinker and all this nonsense. You got to take it on faith. You got to take yeah. exactly. You're taking it on faith, and then, you know that. And that was Peter Fraze that I touched on in the beginning of the show. That core amazing contradiction that, in the tech space, which obviously still rests. I mean, on actually some of the most environmentally dangerous extractive industries on the planet to get things like lithium batteries. But, you know, this world that doesn't, that we could choose to design to be completely socialized and have no scarcity, we're designing to shrink and generate as much scarcity as possible so people can get artificial unnecessary profits for bullshit businesses that don't matter and provide no value. And then on the other hand, you know, ecology, that's what's limitless. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the fact that they had this virtual space where they could construct um, how, whatever sort of relationships economically or socially that they wanted, and they came up with like Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, and like and the <laughs> bi tin so even Tinder, you know, like they right. came up with these things that reflect the biases of the kind of people that they are, which is like really tedious, uh, oh, intellectually overconfident, um, incurious. Uh, suburbanites with limited life experience who actually have no idea how privileged they are right. and you know have, have no sense of of their own um you know place in society well that's um, why they love the pinker stuff right because it's it's not only do you have to not assess yourself in fact assessing yourself is the core era that will keep us from this great theological journey yeah technology so um yeah i do i i, I try to go through all of that, the, the, the stuff, there's a lot of nuts and bolts in the book about, you know, how capitalism functions in Silicon Valley and how, in turn, Silicon Valley companies are rewriting the rules of capitalism in this country. Talk about that. Well, uh, you know, the gig economy is the easiest example. I mean, right. you know, long story short, they're turning us into a nation of rickshaw drivers. And I mean, like, that's... That's the model. I mean, yep. uh, Silicon Valley has been, uh, say what you will about Wall Street, they're horrible, everybody knows it, but Silicon Valley has been the prime uh, mover in terms of uh, transitioning people from full-time jobs with benefits into, uh, you know, jobs that aren't even, I mean, by freelance standards are unacceptable. Fiverr, I talk about Fiverr in the book, you know, and... Uh, Very evil. Yeah, super, I mean, they're just, it's the... Think about, okay, so the premise of Fiverr, in case your list, uh, yeah, viewers and listeners don't yeah. know, is um, that it's a, it's a freelance marketplace where uh, everything is $5 so from, from the customer's point of view. So whoever, whatever you're selling, uh, popular stuff on there is like web design, testimonials is big. I get into that because it's like the, it, one of the main things that people are hired to provide for $5 is like a video testimonial of some product. And usually it's some scam internet marketing thing right <laughs> so you've got like scammers hanging i didn't scammers tap, down. i didn't tap into the secrets of real estate like that type of thing oh yeah and supplements i and mean supplements. you know all oh, kinds okay. of supplements all I right mean, of course are they, okay I uh, this is a sidetrack but are who are the people with all of these like brain pills and like <laughs> i don't get it i mean I, there was this one woman i found that was so prolific on fiverr and she did 
you know, I was kind of like, I, I looked her up and I, you know, there are people I didn't use their real names because it didn't seem fair. And I, uh, you know, right. uh, people with prominence, I, I did. And people who, you know, like people I room, I was roommates with and when I was staying in San Francisco, I changed their names and stuff. Just, and, but this woman, I, I looked her up and it's like, oh man, she's like a struggling college adjunct who's got this like Fiverr sideline where she does testimonials, like right. make the nut. And I, I was starting to feel really sympathetic. And then I saw one she did that was like, you know, it's like a miracle cure and like this supplement cured my husband like my husband came back from iraq and he was really violent to me and like it was really hard around the house but then we bought you know miracle wow. miracle pill x and oh that's everything's so... been better oh, right that's honey so and i mean bad. yeah but I, like and then you revealed her name no, no i but uh, i still it because sort yeah. of Every time I, I came to empathize with my subjects, I'd find something like that would happen, and I'd be like, okay. I mean, you know, there's there's plenty of ba- blame to go around. Well, markets two things to our brains, and this is like the most raw expression of like human exhaustion and desperation there, and yeah, frenetic so desire to make it. Too. That is an example of how they're perverting our society further. I mean, and in terms right. of rewriting the rules, I mean, the idea that somebody, and increasingly it's like, not just somebody's second job. I mean, there haven't been a lot of proper studies. Like, how many people are actually make tr- like making a living on these gig sites? You know, right? Uh, and I, since even doing the re- initial reporting, and now that the book is is out um, on sale today, actually, you can find it in stores. Everybody, <laughs> check it out. Yeah, get it wherever um, you can. Live, work, work, work. Die. Journey I, to the Savage Heart of Silicon Valley by Corey Pine. I I'm got hearing you, more and more stories about. Hold uh, on one second. Let me actually try my pitchman uh, techniques here. Okay. We I didn't understand thing. Silicon Valley at all. I thought it was a place where you can make a lot of money and then just have sex in hot tubs all over Menlo Park. But I realized a couple of things from reading "Live, Work, 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 Die" by Corey Pine. One. You really don't want to have sex in those pot tubs. They're actually disgusting, cesspools of disease. Two, these people believe more bizarre shit than any Abrahamic religion on the planet about the nature (laughs) of the human destiny and human being functioning. Three, you are not going to make money on the internet unless you went to Stanford. (laughs) And four, the only way that you might make money off of the internet if you didn't go to Stanford is if you already own some piece of property in San Francisco and can scam fucking morons that haven't read Corey's book. So I recommend you read it today because it will change your life. That was, uh, that was awesome. That's that was good. awesome. The, uh, there's no yeah. hot tub scene, but there is a... I do go to Cougar Night at the Rosewood Hotel, which actually Stanford <laughs> University owns. It's a long-standing Valley tradition. Yeah. Um, and I didn't actually find... There weren't that many Cougars. It was... It was <laughs> Wait, I'm shocked that it, there it, weren't it Cougars to deliver. in Silicon Valley. It was, no, it was, it was older VC guys and younger women. So Ooh. it was like actually the inverse of what was... Advertised. Well, that makes sense. Um, they oh, wouldn't that sounds get like it. hell on earth. That sounds like the yeah. That so literally that, does like, sound like hell look, on earth. The book is just one scene like that after another. So you get to <laughs> the catharsis. The, the humor and the catharsis is like I am your avatar in these situations. Yeah. People keep coming up to me read it and they're like, I can't. I couldn't have done that. I couldn't. No, I felt and, like that. Like literally, like when I was assessing while I was reading the book, like the and I I was like, when you described like when you arrive in San Francisco and you get your living situation, I'm like, yeah, I'd already be gone. <laughs> Done. I'm not that's big. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, yeah, I don't this is not you with the surveillance cameras or the uh the roommates the surveillance cameras the just everything yeah and it was rough it took a toll and it's funny because i'm not like i think especially by a certain type of new york standard like i can i'm not interested in like you know fake negativity just as much as i'm not interested in like fake positivity but reading like to actually be in a place where people unironically asked what each other's space was, I couldn't do it. Like, what space are you in? Like, nope. I deliver eyeballs I'm... like a fucking ninja. Yeah. <laughs> That's my space. That's my space. Because you'd never say you're a writer. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, just quoting from the book. Now. Right, right, right. You never uh, would say, no, that was a good point. You'd never say you're a writer. You'd have to, you'd have to sex it up in a way that, like, who could possibly be li- like, the, like the type Somebody, of shit? Somebody, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brandon Sutton was uh, DMing me before the show. Oh, and nice. he was like, um, I've been looking at 
uh, at startup job ads and, and uh, the, uh, this is what's a growth hacker? I'm like sales and marketing. Right. Sales and marketing. <laughs> sales and marketing. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I'm, I, I, it pains me that I can translate this. There was a really nice review in Salon uh, over the, I think it ran on Sunday and yeah. I, uh, I was stoked about it except <laughs> I wanted to point out a factual error to the author. He's like, I really admire that Corey Pine was able to do this. You know, this guy's from San Francisco. He's like, I admire that he was able to go into these spaces without getting physically ill. And I was like, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I did suffer. I did get this. physically ill. So yeah, uh, you know, the excerpts uh, and the reviews, I mean, people can look those up, and I, I hope they will and read them. Um, but, you know, when when nobody's pulled out, uh, I did do it at the reading last night. If you come, I'm I'm doing a <clears throat> another reading in D.C. Uh, Wednesday night at Solid State We Box. shared it on our uh, TMBS Facebook page. Okay. Uh, everybody check it out. So with the readings, I'm trying to do stuff that people maybe haven't read from the excerpts yet. But, right. uh, you know, so my, can I do my pitch? Like, yeah, uh, so, course. you Go. know, the narrative uh, core of the music? book is me pitching my, no. Okay. I mean, well, it depends. What kind of music? Any, uh, if, if that's up to the yeah. super producer. What you should say is, fuck yeah, <laughs> I deliver pitches like a fucking Red Army guard. Do I look like a billionaire to you? I mean, my, my <laughs> skills are... Oh, I'm a little rusty. This is good pitch music. All right, right here. Let me tell you I want to talk to you with... I want my friend Corey now. He's going to explain... This is an incredible book. It really will change everything, right, Corey? Let me tell you about an incredible investment opportunity. <laughs> Described at length in the book. I will only give you enough here that makes you interested to buy the book. That's right. Uh, it's called Labor Sign up in the drop down menu. It's called laborize.com. <laughs> this website is still up, by the way. Uh, can we, can we get you that can pull up? it up? Yeah. Uh, Laborize is a uh, business uh, oriented. Uh, service provider. Um, right. We offer uh, SAS opportunities, <laughs> strikes as a service, laborize, <laughs> strikes as a service. Our motto, organize the competition. That gives you the basic gist of the business, the, the plan here. Uh, so lab <laughs> Yeah, yeah, do it like a deck. Their solidarity is your opportunity for those who can't see this. Uh, our, our, our target uh, client is a startup corporation or a, a large enterprise who is seeking to gain a temporary competitive <laughs> advantage. And the unique way that we offer this is to organize a union movement at your principal competitors. <laughs> Thus, uh, delaying their operation schedule, uh, demoralizing their workforce, and distracting their management. Right. Uh, Laborize strikes as, as a service. Uh, and any questions, uh, please email us at a... I believe that email is central.committee at laborize.com. Did I get that right? <laughs> you know what I love about it, too? Is that, like, the obvious, like, you know, year-long horizon thought process is, oh, my, what if, if you uh, raise the standards in my whole industry, then all of a sudden my workers are going to want basic human necessities. But the thought process <laughs> of your average, like, company is sh so short-term that I could actually see them being like, Fuck it! Like next week, this will terrorize my competition. Fuck a year from now. That you you had my epiphany just now. You, I, I brought you through that process, and I realized that <laughs> laborize.com could be the startup that undoes capitalism because eventually every company would hire us to organize a union at their competitor until there was just one company left, and, and then, then we, we bring out the pitchfork. Would yeah, be and then we would just look at that and be like, you. And then we could take them out. Wouldn't that, it be something if that actually is how it ended? <laughs> <laughs> that's why you have to buy the book? And that's what Marx meant by the capitalist will sell his own noose. He literally was projecting laborize.com. Can we just take a brief detour, Corey? I want to do, we have a bunch of sound that we're going to do in the post game, but okay. I want to do the sound up front because I've noticed, and it really disturbs me, that Elon Musk as a, personal brand has withstood like every i mean everything from the fact that i have to say even if we're taking it within context like he ain't no steve jobs like i was i was looking for steve jobs for a cold open sound no steve jobs is a monster and don't get me wrong of course actually compared to like musk you're saying yeah i'm saying intellectually presentation style personal background he's a much more interesting villain. Monster is a good word, by the way. Oh, yeah. he's a oh <laughs> Steve Jobs was a was a, a horrible, horrible human being, no doubt about it. But Elon Musk is a is a bore and probably also a pretty horrible human being as well. And uh, I his, he he divorced <laughs> 
he divorced his wife because, um, as she put it, uh, she wasn't going blonde enough. Well, that's a, <laughs> wow, Elon, it's a good point. I had no idea welcome how much to we the, had. Yeah. I welcome you to the were, economic advisors. Yeah, yeah, welcome to the economic advisor. Yeah. <laughs> you want to have sex with my daughter? I know I do. By economic, uh, <laughs> I mean advise my wife and my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, Melania is not going. Looks like my daughter enough. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know. So I I've done videos where it's like it's not even. I, I'm even making just a more serious point that even if you took the most such as they could be, right? The most even if you accepted the premise, which I don't. Like, let's be real. He's a glorified government contractor and he's an asshole on many levels. But like, even though I said, look, Elon Musk is a nice guy and he's investing in environment and technology and you know all that blah 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 jerk off stuff, that, which doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Which let me just say. I, you're going to hack into him in a yeah, second. Sure. I'm into it. But I'm saying even even if I stipulated all that nonsense, nobody should be a billionaire. Period. That's yeah. insane. And I like when I make when I criticize, you know you know, Pinker or Harris or any of these other just, you know, disgusting logic lords, I expect the like, out of context. But, to you know, to stand for Elon Musk is maybe the most pathetic, like, because it's even pathetic by like, like, I give Elon Musk no credit, but I will give him this. He was not on YouTube videos defending his equivalent. He was figuring out a way to, you know, hack the financial system on his behalf, right? Like, it's utterly pathetic that there's a cult around him. And we pulled this video. This is um, from the Nerdist. And these guys literally do a segment called Musk Watch. And not watch like, here's a guy who might be involved in crimes, or here's a, a capitalist with monopolistic tendencies, or here's a guy who's a glorified government contractor but has a brand as a... You know, Tony Stark, they literally worship him and watch his every is move. This is this the Nerdist podcast with Chris, what's his name? No, well, it's part of the same oh, empire. It's that network, okay. I don't know who these two guys are. Well, this is uh, these two guys are uh, Kyle Hill and Dan Casey, excuse me. But this is really funny because this is them and their blind tech worship, and they're having to deal with the fact that actually, like, things are looking really bad Elon Musk wise. <laughs> Take a look at this. Did Elon Musk go full supervillain? We certainly hope not. Find out more on today's Musk Watch! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Tesla's had a pretty rough week, and we're not here to sugarcoat it. No. Um, no, it's worse than I thought. First, it was reported that the production of the Model 3 stopped temporarily, Ooh. forcing employees to use their vacation days or go unpaid. Then it was reported that to make up for lost time, the beleaguered factory is going to produce Model 3s 24-7 until June. Now that's production hell, Dan. <laughs> I'll say. Then to top it all off, the Center for Investigative Reporting reported that, oh, <laughs> it's kind of their whole thing, reported that Tesla might be covering up workplace injuries and may not be taking important safety precautions. This includes things like not painting safety lines yellow, or having forklifts not beep while operating because Elon Musk doesn't like the color yellow or all the beeping. Yeah, that's that would be one step too far, and these are some pretty serious accusations. We hope that they are remedied in a timely manner if they are true. Look, we like to joke here, but Dad's not just getting a free pass from us. Just because no. we like the guy doesn't mean we think he can do no wrong. Yeah, I'm not just gonna... Yeah, yeah, wouldn't just blindly follow you. You know, we do joke about you being a supervillain, Elon, but please don't actually become one. You're one of the only people who gives me hope in a terrible, dark world. And <laughs> Corey, you are Silicon Valley. Tra There's so much going on there. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have another amazing. beer, guys? I'm actually really amazing. depressed and disturbed by this. I, but I'm almost part of me is almost saying, wrong. "Welcome to the left, guys." Well, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That. Okay. Yeah. The first of all the thing that's going on there. Yeah. Like, why is it the only thing that gives him hope? It's because he's like he's got no political imagination or education. I mean, right. like, like, hello. Let me introduce you guys to uh, some concepts like, uh, you know, labor power, labor theory of value. Right. right. And, you, you know, in the in the con I mean, I'm sure they're concerned about say uh, safety is like genuine, like they don't want people to get hurt. But, uh, what, you know, he's, he's wearing the SpaceX like hoodie and 
SpaceX, I discovered in my reporting, uh, one of its nicknames among employees is Slave X. Right. You know, and people are finding out about working conditions in the Tesla factories now. But this is like this is something that has been a characteristic of Musk's entire career. And why do you think he's a billionaire? I mean, he's a he's a horrible boss. Right. Of course, he's horrible to all the people that. <laughs> why is it that as like livelihood. people with a so, Marxist view, like? I take capitalism seriously enough, and I, in a, in a, in a separated from morality, I respect it enough to know that in order to be Elon Musk, you have to be a monster. That's just the way it works. Yeah, but it's not a they, personal but, comment on him. But guys, like, I mean, you know, I met, I talked to so many people like this when right. I was reporting the book, and and it's still, I mean, I think that you know that there is a tech backlash building, and I think your average person who's not like way in deep ideologically with the idea of, um, you know, technological solutions to everything. My mom, for instance. Your mom probably is starting to realize, like. <laughs> She's a huge tech, tech skeptic. Well, sorry, that's not what she. <laughs> okay, look. <laughs> Let's just calm I'm down sorry. for a second, everybody. Uh, yo, Corey, you are not going to take control of this show. <laughs> <laughs> I want to disrupt the important tech analysis with Bring puerile middle joke. school. I will do okay. that as the host. This All right, why, go ahead. This is why I'm here. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, last night in New York on my tour. That's so exactly that's right. I came here for. Uh, that's. Well, people, I think average people are wising up that, right. you know, the, the, the techies aren't going to solve all their problems and they're not all that. And there's been a lot of hype over the last 10 years or so. And I think people are figuring that out who aren't in deep. What separates these, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to just get too please Freudian. Do it. Freudian. Just do it. No, do it. Dude, man, let's save it for the post game and the patrons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give them a hint. Uh, Give look, them a hint of I what mean, they get. They really love Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Why? And well, what is the there's love? A power this fantasy. guy is there's not a power fantasy. Yeah. And, okay. and and the billionaires have this this new class of like Gen X billionaires is I mean they are the nerdist right empire right. Right? right it is revenge of the nerds they are comic book geeks and you know they want they you know, do he need wants to have to their te- head stuffed in toilets well right. you know I, I I hear that joke like bring back bullying and so, didn't some journalist get fired like some Gizmodo person or somebody got fired for that <laughs> really I, I mean, wow yeah I well I mean you know you can't offend the readers that much <laughs> um but uh yeah I mean actually I mean in my more enlightened humanitarian moments I would say maybe the fact i mean the baseline of all of this is markets and capital but maybe in terms of the specific cultural stuff as, maybe these guys are maybe bullied too much as, which is partially well, why exactly. they're such assholes and right it, and as so and we as have nerdy to stop white, bullying uh, i don't whatever but as yeah, nerdy white guys you. i mean there is uh there is a there's a path uh, uh available to them yeah you know that the, the tech provides you know they're they might not be they might their social skills might be lacking uh they're their ability to uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh Sam Biddle yes <laughs> Sam Biddle's actually a really good reporter he's at the Intercept now uh, Biddle did a lot of the stuff about that startup Clinkle that I was I was talking so he about. wrote um, bring back bullying ultimately hashtag Gamergate is reaffirming what we've known true to be true for decades nerds should be constantly shamed and degraded into submission. I describe I, in the book I describe Gamergate as the first sort of alt-right terror campaign. I mean yeah. it was a dry, a dry run for a lot of well not a dry run because actual people suffered from it but uh, sort yeah. of a, an early prototype of, of what the kind of stuff we saw in you know Charlottesville and uh, you know the online culture wars but uh, getting a little far afield here uh, you know tech provides a a a fantasy that to uh, you know white male nerds seems like achievable, actually achievable, and then they see Musk as like a realization of of their ideal. So that's why they man. get so emotional about yeah, it. Yeah, they're it, yeah because they, they just, call him dad. I mean, they're not even like they're so, not, not even subtext. I mean, there's something. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, <laughs> it's just so bizarre when you. It's like it, I don't. I don't. I honestly, I just don't understand. Like. I think of something that's like, you know, I've, I've done a lot of content recently on what's happening in Brazil with Lula. Don't say and content. I'm a, don't sorry? Say, don't say content. I've been doing a lot of content in my space because <laughs> um, I'm an international relations ninja and I fucking demand the attention economy in my zone. Whatever the fuck. I'm that trying. was good. No. Yeah. I'm trying to hack the uh, Brazil space more. So <laughs> through providing like actionable content. So no, but, uh, 
I've been doing a lot of stuff on Brazil and Lula. And, you know, actually, I mean, my basic read, the simplest read is I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan. And I think that this is a soft coup. And I think that this is a very admirable guy. Now, and, and this is not, you know, this is not either like a plutocrat, which any normal sane person should just be innately skeptical of if you're not a plutocrat yourself. And this is not some, you know, a wanker that writes tech utopia books or atheism tracks. This is a, you know, a political leader who has lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty and, you know, came from nowhere to become president of one of the most stratified countries in the world. I mean, this is real stuff. Now, if somebody counters me and says that, you know, they actually don't buy it and they think, in fact, he is very corrupt or they point out all sorts of failings of his government and his record, some of which are, you know, entirely legitimate. I guess my point is that I, I, I have never even been able to have that sort of emotional relationship, even with people that I think are, you know, sort of objectively admirable actors. But I've never felt like, oh, my God, somebody said Lula is this. I need to go argue, you know, or, 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 or defend them. Now, granted, I have a platform, so that's a different thing. But the emotional attention that's invested in people that either are sort of like, you know, non-remarkable in terms of their output or literally occupy a position that is just innately in opposition to anybody that doesn't occupy that position themselves. Like, you know, it's just bizarre. Like, you know, it's like unless you're on a private jet to go see the, uh, you know, Mayweather-McGregor fight, you shouldn't be happy with how the world works. You know, I it's it's the product. Uh, I mean, the kind of emotional attachments that you're talking about yeah. are and they don't make any sense. And it's so funny that they come from people that believe themselves so rational. Right. Uh, there's a really great irony in that. Uh, it's the result of really sophisticated propaganda. I mean, and I hope that one thing that people take from my book is um, an awareness of how <coughs> really how powerful these companies are. I mean, we're on YouTube. Yep. You know, your show, my show, we're on Patreon. These platforms, I mean, yep. they have succeeded in taking over the media, yep. right? These are our new overlords. I'm not even joking. There's I no mean, doubt. they're still my boss. I'm not, you know, like, I, I'm i getting my, like, monthly Patreon check like every other schmo on the platform. And, like, if they make a decision that changes how things work, like, that affects me. Same, I mean, I know you, you all with YouTube shows and monetization no have doubt. to deal with that, right? Yep. Like, and, uh, you know, that workplace shooting at YouTube, I mean, uh, was that not a, a, a vlogger who was, like, really frustrated about the monetization issue? And it's a yep. huge, I mean, look at the cultural currency it has um, on the right. Yep. You know, it's it's because people like have an actual not just emotional investment in, you know, the, the oligarchs that are running these platforms, but an actual economic stake as well. Well, I think uh, that's true. But I think it's very odd. That one of the things that is does seem to be distinct about Silicon Valley, and it's not that there hasn't always been, you know, cultural stories that correlate with capitalism. But I think that, at least in my read, it's very distinct to have a market space that actually brands itself and comes through emotions first. You know, even Wall Street at the height of its cultural moments, like in the 80s with Greetings Good or during, you know, some of the kind of Clinton and Obama, like, oh, these brilliant quants. At the end of the day, it still was like, you come here to make a fucking ton of money. And that was coherent. In this world, this sort of bizarre but inversion. But people do think they're going to make a ton of money. Right. I mean, that's the startup myth. And that's right. uh, that's why I decided that, you know, plunging in and doing the startup thing, everybody thinks that they can do it. It's the it's the core mythology of our country. Right. Right? right. Like, work hard, have a good idea. You can, you can be, you know... Uh, J.P. Morgan, you can be president. You can be Thomas Edison. You can be Elon Musk. Right. Right. So, um, I mean, the the failure of imagination and education, like that you saw in that video with the, the attitude of those guys toward their, you know, like uh, cult leader, uh, you know, deity, demigod yeah. figure, uh, is that they don't understand that it, all of that stuff is a bunch of lies. Like the hardest working people in this country are people that we, uh, you know, don't give citizenship to and deport on a whim, yep. you know? Right. And, and, and stereotype is lazy. Right. Like, they, they, don't, they don't, for whatever reason, and I'm sure, you know, you probably have other guests on that are more knowledgeable about this, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seep 
in. It's... And, you know, part of it is maybe it's a survival adaptation. I mean, if you think about the way that people talk about these billionaires that are deeply invested, like you even see it in, you know, in the white bread sort of business world, uh, the Rotary Club, I mean, the, the, the Buffett cult, right? right? The Warren Buffett cult is very right. similar. Right, that's true. Like he can do no wrong and like they wait for the oracular wisdom to come down and people go nuts to go to his conferences and like there's a whole mini media the empire. Sage about... of, they literally call him the Sage of Omaha. Yeah, and, but right. if you think about it as kissing up to the boss... You know, it and, makes and a in a sense, sense, with the tech platforms, I mean, we are kissing up to the boss. I mean, even people like look at the way that people f- perform on social media. I mean, they do believe they have internalized we're all these doing ideas free we're getting, labor for these people. Well, what's hours Twitter's a day? Got, you know, once I added up, right. what would right. what would Twitter owe me? Because I do tweet too much, but what would they owe me if I was getting like a, a journalist, you know, let's say a generous journalist rate of like a now generous like quarter reward, let's say. Yep. You know, like I'd get maybe for a magazine piece, you know, talking about what magazines are paying is important, <laughs> fellow journalists. Uh, it's a lot of money yep. that I've given them. And what is their valuation? Like, where is the value of these companies? Like, what, what do you break it down? Like, where does the actual value come from? Right. You know, it's from all the users. It's our attention. And it's the writing that we do for free on the no, so I mean, well, that's the it, That's the other double irony of it is that they've branded it as... These are all these innately pleasurable activities and beneficial ones, which we provide for you for free. When in reality, the whole engine that provides the money is us doing all this free labor, which they've actually hustled us and conned us into thinking is, oh, this is just fun stuff that we get to do for free. There's a really smart woman uh, who lives here in New York, and I'm afraid her name escapes me. Um, You should have her on, maybe. Uh, She she did a campaign um, called, sort of as a joke, and this was a few years ago, called Wages for Facebook. Yep. And uh, she described, I think, in the essay for Descent, or maybe somebody wrote for Descent and quoted her about it, how, you know, she talked about it to her students, like college-age students at NYU or CUNY or something, uh, and their reaction was almost universally hostile. Wow. Like, they were mad that she would suggest that they should get paid to post and wow. create value for Facebook. And that, <clears throat> similar to the, the cult reaction with people like Musk, I mean, we're talking about cultural programming. I mean, this stuff is yeah. deep. Like we're talking about core s- social values um, and beliefs that are instilled in us from a very young age. And, and you know, the Silicon Valley startup get rich, uh, you know, on a good idea mythos is, I mean, it's like, yeah, a very American story. Like it is, it is like our cultural. It's in our uh, cultural DNA. Yeah. Uh, guys, oh. we're going to go to the post game. Oh, is it time already? It is time already. We have way more to get to. We have, you're going to do a Jordan Peterson piece with me. Oh, good. You're going to do, uh, we've got a bunch of other stuff. Uh, let um, me, before you cut to the post game, let me plug the DC event. Uh, yeah, plug everything. Wed, wed, uh, live, work, work, or die. A journey to the Savage Heart of Silicon Valley, available in bookstores today on Amazon. News Tell from Nowhere com. podcast. News Catch from Nowhere on, podcast. On, a, on Patreon. I'm a happy patron of it myself. Yeah, uh, so upcoming dates for readings. I am on book tour. Uh, New York is done, sorry, but uh, DC on Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Solid State Books. Three venues in the Bay Area. Uh, you can look them up on my, uh, I think it's my pin tweet, at Corey Pine, my pin tweet has a schedule, but uh, San Francisco, Stanford Mountain View, uh, next week. Awesome. All right. And guys, uh, become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash TNBS. We're growing, and that means we can sustain this really impressive community um, and keep giving you this essential content as well once we get to that next big goal, which is 2K, we will start doing bit more content see the food uh bucket challenge <laughs> and a whole lot more thank you super producer matt leck thank you super producer david Sladek. thank you head theoretician david grishkam uh we're going to be turning on the phones and the ims become a patron today illicit history of the german sdp this weekend